Craig is usually a fan of water cooler talk, but it's draft season and that's all anyone wants to talk about. The Athletic has loads of articles about this year's draft, but Greg doesn't have The Athletic, so now he's filling up his water bottle in the bathroom sink. Which, to remind you, is the sink people use after they use the bathroom. Get The Athletic and get the info you need to speak draft fluently. Save big money on your next project. Now at Menards. Update your home with low-maintenance vinyl windows from Jeldwin. They're durable, energy efficient, and are low-maintenance. Menards carries over 100 different size and style options in stock. Ready to take home today. Say big on gel one windows now at Menards. And don't forget to check out our flyer on Menards.com for all the great deals happening now. Save big money at Menards. Welcome to the Dogs Podcast with your hosts, Blake Reniker, Justin Charles, and Josh All. What's up, Browns fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Dogs Podcast presented by Omaha Steaks. Josh All with you today, and I've got one of my favorite guests that we have on here every single year to talk draft. This is Mr. Brian Bosard from DraftCountdown.com. Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It is obviously busy season for me, but I always got time for the for your your podcast. I love your guys' show, and uh, even though, like I said, we don't see eye to eye on the fandom spectrum <laughs> there, but you know. I like what you guys do there. It's a really fun show. I always like coming off. No, just full disclaimer for everybody out there. Yes, Brian is an AFC North fan, but he roots for the other Ohio team down south in Cincinnati. But you know what? We put all that aside because you are an, an NFL draft expert. This is what you do. You've got all the information, the details, the knowledge. You go through the whole process. So we love having you on here to talk draft. And it's always fun to have a little banter. But I mean... We can find other things in common. For instance, I love your shirt. Thank you. That is a great shirt. I got my my stepson is big into Spidey and his amazing friends right now. So we're doing a lot of Spider Man, and I'm pretty glad they uh, created that show. Yeah, that's my I, I, my daughter is older than that now, so it's like she's moved past all that that stuff. Uh, really wish she'd watch X Men '97 with oh. me, but she won't. She won't commit to that. Uh, fact, maybe, maybe it's a good thing she does it though. I haven't dived back into X Men '97, but I saw it pop up the other day on there. I was like, oh, I gotta get, I gotta get some time for this for sure. I, I had an emotional breakdown after watching an episode the other day. So, so you got that to look forward to. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Well, I'm definitely diving into that soon. So, but if you guys want to check out more of Brian's stuff, just before we get started here, head over to Twitter and you can find Brian himself on Twitter at uh, deep fried draft and then follow draft countdown at draft countdown on Twitter and then go to DraftCountdown.com and check out everything these guys are doing over there and all the work that Brian's putting in to the research, which we are going to dive into. All right, so we were talking just a little bit before the show, and I think before we dive into any of the main subjects here that we want to get through, you were asking me about uh, Jordan Hicks, which I thought that was an interesting. You said, what was the contract? You know, it came out for him, I believe it was two two years, uh, $8 million contract, $4 million a year. So like you said, not anything that's stopping the Browns from replacing Jordan Hicks or adding to that position in the draft. Right, and because I was looking at the Browns roster, you know, before we came on, and I'm like, man, there's there isn't any holes on this team outside of if you want to call middle linebacker a hole. But right. as you told me, the Browns don't really value that position as much, or it's just not going to play a lot. So you're probably not going to put a whole lot of draft capital in that or upgrade that. You basically you put eight million dollars in for a rotational guy. That's fine. So. It's got to be good for Browns fans and yourself to know that, like, whoever they come up with here at pick 54, I believe it is, yep. doesn't have to play immediately, right? They're just guys that can get in a rotation and help out. So it kind of opens you up to, okay, yes, we don't need this defensive end that slipped here, but, you know, maybe a year from now, somebody gets hurt. We got a cap casualty. We got to cut, trim some fat somewhere. Then this guy's suddenly getting, you know, a lot of snaps to play. So as Browns fans, I, I feel like it just opens up everything to what they can do with the with their draft picks. 
Man, we've been talking about that a lot uh, in recent weeks on this show. Just every time the draft comes up, we we make sure to mention that the Browns are in a unique position that Browns fans still, we are still not used to this after decades of, you're, you're drafting guys typically in the fifth round saying, God, I hope this guy can start. And now we're drafting guys in the second round saying, we don't need anybody that we pick this year to play any meaningful snaps whatsoever. Outside of injury, of course, if guys get injured yeah. last year, Dewan Jones was supposed to be a, a shot in the dark developmental guy that we hope could eventually be a starter. Injury happens week one. He comes in and it's like, damn, we got a starter immediately. So those things happen. But you're right. The Browns are not going into this draft looking for guys that they expect to play from day one, which is very, very strange for us. Right. Yeah, it's like so. There's not a whole lot of guys. I'm like, and they've spent like, like, and we're going to talk about wide receiver, but they've spent a lot of money in draft capital in that position. Is that something they really want to attack that early? When you've got multiple third round picks, you spent on that in the last two drafts. You traded for Jerry Judy. You traded for Amari Cooper. You traded for Elijah Moore. I mean, where is the, if you spend a second or third round pick on a wide receiver? When is he going to play? It's a great point because we used a third round pick last year on Cedric Tillman. And I was just talking to somebody on social media this morning about, you know, hey, what are the expectations for Tillman this year? And I said, I honestly don't know. There's a very realistic op- or, op- or possibility if the Browns draft a wide receiver in the second or third this year, Tillman all of a sudden could be looking at like the sixth option in the offense when you factor in a guy like David Njoku into the receiving weapon. So it it's crazy how just just packed that wide receiver room is. But I was going to ask you about that because, you know, the Browns have spent a top 30 pick. They've met with a guy like Troy Franklin from Oregon. They met with him twice now. They've met with Malachi Corley and Malik Washington and some different names. I'm trying to think who else here, but, you know, those are just the ones off the top of my head. And do you think the Browns would, Lad McConkey was another one. That was who I was thinking of. Do the Browns make a play for wide receiver? Because, my personal opinion is I doubt they trade up. I, they just traded, Lee, and this is a little quick news update for everybody. They just traded Leroy Watson, who you might not even remember was on the team from last year. We signed him off the uh, 49ers practice squad in November. He was signed to a futures contract, and then we just traded him to the Titans for a seventh round pick. So we added additional draft capital. But I just, I see the Browns sitting back waiting to see who falls. And if there's nobody there that they're in love with, or they think, hey, we can move back 10 spots here get an extra pick and still get the guy we want. I think that's the more likely scenario. Yeah, I I completely agree. Cause like I said, you're not going to, you're not going to require that person to play. And like you mentioned, Troy Franklin, I think he's going to be on the board of 54. I mean, he's fast, but he's small. Like he's, he's really small frame. So I think, you know, the, the, the success rate of those guys that come into the league, I want, I saw the other day, it was, they use BMI and stuff like that. These it's metrics that are above my, above my head, but the hit rate on those guys isn't very high. I mean, you basically had Devontae Smith and that's about it. You know, it, it, it becomes a lot murkier after that. So is and Troy Frankel was one of those guys that was on that list this year. So just based on that, he could be available at that spot, as well as some others that you mentioned that they that had visits with. I mean Malachi Corey, I'm a big fan of his game. I think okay. he's Debo Samuel, you know, coming again here just the way he's built and the way he runs after the catch i mean that that's a guy that i i would like to have on my team but again it's like i mean what what is it are we pushing david bell off the roster already i then that's the guy that i feel is at a risk of maybe not making the roster if if the browns go wide receiver with the second or third round pick for sure yeah i i don't i don't know man that i mean you're you're, you're Go ahead. Yeah, you're, you're going to be shopping David Bell for a conditional 25 yes, pick. Absolutely, because, you know, they've, they've still got a guy like James Prochet who they keep around because of the returning abilities and things like that. Now, does Naeem Hines take over some of that? We'll see how it all plays out. But as far as your top four or five receivers, I mean, there's really no room to add anybody. And Cor- a guy like Corley, I think, he's from what I understand of him. And you tell me a little bit more about Malachi Corley, but I feel like he's the type of player that you – you find ways to get the ball into his hands and he's going to with just with the way he gets open and things he's going to demand targets his his instagram uh name is yak king <laughs> and he was and that's it's very apropos and i when i saw him at the senior bowl his 
thighs are like just tree trunks. Like you, you're, 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 you see thighs on this guy and you think he's an offensive lineman. That's how thickly built he is. He's built like a running back, but has the explosion of a wide receiver. Ran at four, a high four, four range, maybe low four fives, uh, depending on who was talking to you at, at their pro day. But I'm a big fan of Malachi Corley. I, I think he's a mid second to late second round spot. He, he maybe if the Browns, like you said, moved back off of 54, picked up an extra pick, maybe he's there at the bottom of the second round for a team that came up. I, I, I could see it. I mean, I can, and like you said, definitely, I think his snaps, I mean, he's going to take away, he could even take away snaps from Elijah Moore. I mean, I, I think yeah. they're, they're, mm-hmm. they're playing a similar position there. So it, it, it would be, be interesting. To say well, the least. And I know we we preface this whole conversation talking about how packed the wide receiver room is for the Browns. But if you're thinking like Andrew Barry and like a general manager should, what what is the deal next year? You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you've got Amari Cooper as of this moment, this is the last year. We don't know if he's going to be taking, you know, a restructure to add on some years and if he's going to be here next year. We locked up Jerry Judy, but this is Elijah Moore's last year. So as far as 25 is concerned, you're looking at Jerry Judy and Cedric Tillman. So that's when you look at it that way, wide receiver right. makes a whole lot of sense to try to get a guy that can right. develop and progress and be you know a top option in the offense moving forward. And I think Malachi Corley, the more I, I watch him and you know do work on him, I'm thinking, ah, I, I would love to see him in one of these orange helmets right here. But so if we move down a little bit further in the draft, I think... Another name that's interesting because there's obviously been off the field maturity knocks on this guy and everything. And I haven't dived much into that stuff, but just from what I've listened to and heard from scouts analyzing Jermaine Burton from Alabama, it sounds like this guy has the potential to be a do it all wide receiver. That's not getting a whole lot of hype so far. What do you think about Burton? The interesting thing with him this year was Alabama's passing game kind of went through him and that's generally been a a, a angle for success for players coming to the league they put some top receivers you know in the league here recently um but he was the guy for Jalen Milrow last year he was his go-to and it's it's an interesting player there is the off the field stuff or I guess technically it was on field uh but it was just after a game so what was it do you remember I, I want to say he punched a woman on the field oh geez. it was in one of those field storming deals and and I, I don't know I, I don't know all the angles of the story but I know there's video of him uh, of him doing it so mm. it's it, there's that and there may be some other stuff too he's bounced around multiple different colleges I want to say he was at Georgia and I then so and Alabama as well so there could have been something there I I, I don't know the full details but I think he will be on the board in the third round for sure. Um, so it, it's it's an interesting note. And but the Browns have kind of, I'm not going to say have steered away from those guys, right? But it's it's they have it they have it not like well, especially with draft picks anyway. So we'll yeah. see how they treat it because there there's a couple of guys like that in this draft class that I think could fall in their laps as a well, we're going to we're going to take him here because we the upside is too high. Yeah. That makes a whole lot of sense, especially considering like in the second round. So, say they're sitting at 54 and they, you know, there's a guy there they want to pick. What do you think the most likely scenario is? Like, do they go playmaker, a wide receiver or something like that or do they prioritize the offensive line because we know that the Browns have three starting caliber tackles on the roster right now? But a year from now, again, like with the wide receivers, we might just have one. It might just be Dewan Jones and uh, who's, who's playing the other spot. We don't know how much longer Joel Petoni is going to play. And we know why Teller's contract's getting to the point where he's going to become a movable asset. And I just, personally, I feel like the Browns come away from this draft with a guard and a tackle. Probably two offensive linemen. But do you think there's anybody in the second round on the offensive line that could be available that you think the Browns are honing in on? Yeah, like you said, it really depends on you have some versatile offensive linemen in this class, and I think that's what's really good. So you're to me, I think you're looking at someone like maybe a Cooper Beebe from Kansas mm-hmm. State. 
If yep. he's available in mid second round, this guy's just super fun to watch. I mean, he's one of those play through the whistle guys. I think he can. I think he could play tackle in a pinch. He's not at Kansas State. Um, he could play. He's he's a plug and play guard immediately, uh, in my opinion. And I'm not I'm not ruling out that he can't play center. I'm not sure he has, if he's done it or not. But you know, it it could be a a, a skill he could acquire uh, at some point. Zach Frazier from West Virginia. You want to talk about tough? This guy's doubled man broke his leg their last regular season game at uh, West Virginia this year, and he showed up at the Senior Bowl, went through like drills. He didn't do any physical contact, but went through drills, went through the drills at the Combine, and then actually did a workout at his pro day. Okay. After breaking his leg in late November. That's so, insane. Yeah. And he's a starting level center guard immediately as well. So uh, those are two names right there as well. Christian Haynes is an older prospect which kind of, in my opinion, takes him off the Browns' radar that early on as they tend to like them younger 21- to 22-year-olds early in the draft. Day three, they maybe throw it out the window a little bit, but uh, that's what I think kind of takes Christian Haynes off the board uh, in the second round. This episode is brought to you by Omaha Steaks. Browns fans, nothing says summer is on its way like the taste of a juicy, tender burger that is grilled to perfection. And nobody does burger perfection like Omaha Steaks. And right now, when you guys go to omahasteaks.com slash dogs, you can order the limited time burger perfection flight. This is one of my favorite deals from last year that they did, and I'm so glad they're doing it again. You guys get 24 mouthwatering steak burgers, not just regular burgers, Freaking steak burgers, the pure ground filet mignon burgers, the New York strip burgers, the ribeye burgers, the brisket burgers, the sirloin burgers, and the all new porterhouse burgers. And you get all of that for just $89.99 when you use our code DAWGS DOGS when you check out. Each six ounce burger is filled with flavor from the mild and tender filet mignon to the rich and buttery ribeye. The quality and deliciousness of these burgers can only come from Omaha Steaks and they are guaranteed to satisfy. And guys, at $3.75 a patty, you really can't beat that with the price of food right now. And the price of meat in the grocery stores is absolutely ridiculous. You cannot beat this deal. 90 bucks, 89.99 for 24 of these phenomenal, delicious, awesome steak burgers. And you get all of that when you use code DOGS at checkout. Go to omahasteaks.com, order the Burger Perfection Flight today, and do not forget to use that promo code DOGS, D-A-W-G-S, when you check out to get everything. The 24 delicious burgers. Hurry, because these supplies are limited. Take advantage of this opportunity now before supplies run out. OmahaSteaks.com slash dogs, promo code dogs. Before we move on, Ohio, Bet365 is offering new users $150 in bonus bets this month. To receive your bonus bets, all you have to do is sign up for Bet365 using our link, make a first deposit of $10, and place a $5 wager on any game. Once that first $5 bet settles, you will receive $150 in bonus bets, even if you lose the bet. To be eligible for this sign-up bonus, you must sign up through our link down in the description. So if you haven't yet signed up for Bet365, click our link in the description and place that first bet. This offer is only available for new customers who are 21 and older and physically present in Ohio. Please gamble responsibly. If you or a loved one has a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. Check the episode description for the full terms to see if you can qualify. Okay. And then one name that I've been high on personally that I feel like the Browns can get a little bit later in the draft is JV and Cohen from Miami. What do you know about Cohen? Started at Alabama when he was there. I remember one of our early mock drafts we did, we projected him as a first round pick as a guard. Oh, at really? Alabama. Oh, okay. That, but that was two years ago. He hasn't played up to that since then, but he kind of bounced back a little bit this year at Miami, had a really good season on the inside. Um, I, I don't, I actually, I think he might end up falling into that early day three area. You know, so maybe a, a, a target in the fourth round, you know, maybe if you pick up another one of those picks in a move down scenario, Cohen is a guy you could target in the fourth round area. I, I, I think third round might be a little too rich, but fourth round area is is where I could see JV and Cohen coming off the board. Gotcha. And then another name that just, honestly, this just popped up like yesterday, but I saw that the Browns had already met with Brandon Coleman. Uh, guard slash tackle from TCU. It looks like they're projecting him to be a guard in the NFL, but he's got the size to play both. Can you tell me anything about Coleman? Best athlete to draft. 
Really? Like okay. almost of any position, he's the one of the best athletes huh. in the entire draft class, regardless of position. No kidding. Uh, his testing was, it, it took me aback. I wasn't expecting it. And he, uh, trying to trying to pull it up really quick here. Yeah, go for um, it. Yeah, here we go. Um, at 6'4", 3'13", 34-inch arm. So he's got the length and the size to play tackle, but ran a 4'9", 40 with a one seven three split, had a 34 vertical and a nine foot six broad jump testing as a ninety nine percent athlete, ninety nine point eight percent. Oh, I saw. Athlete. Is that is that the Raz or is that different? Yes, I saw, that's the Raz. Okay, that's what I saw. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Nine point nine eight Raz, and it's <laughs> it's incredible. Um, does the tape match that? Maybe not. But it's as a developmental player, like you mentioned, as a guy you could draft as a let's let's let him at tackle. He's better. Got to be better than Hakim Adeniji, right? So. I don't know. I, I, know, I don't. I was going to ask you about, about him too. I know all about Hakeem Adeniji, and that's not a guy I want playing significant snaps. For my oh, I'm sorry. Team. I was thinking of somebody else. Yes, Adeniji, yeah. the guy we just uh, signed. Yeah, yeah, I know. I've kind of heard that from some Bengals fans too. Like, yeah, yeah. He. It's probably how Browns fans would react if somebody signed James Hudson. Somebody would be like, hmm, "Good luck with that." You're right. You know. I mean, he started in the Super Bowl. That's about the positive <laughs> thing you can say about it. Okay. Couldn't well, block Aaron Donald though. Yeah, well, and who really could? Well, but, who could? You're right. Yeah. But, but I mean, no, as far uh, as a depth piece, that's fine. But yeah, a guy like if a guy like Coleman can come in and give you that upside where, again, uh-huh. we've got Conklin, we've got Wills, we've got Jones. We don't need this if it's Coleman. We don't need him to be a tackle for us this year. At least hopefully not. I want to say Dane Brugger in the Beast that was really so that I had him as had Coleman as a tackle, and I think it was his number nine offensive tackle, which would put him in that uh late second or in that round pick 54 mix mm. if that's where you're looking so that might be where he would have to come off the board if, if he in, is indeed like the ninth offense because we're going to see a lot of those guys uh go before the browns ever see the clock yeah you're right and that's the thing i am so excited for the draft i just it is so fun to watch and, and see where these guys go and there's names that you're like oh, i cannot believe he went already and then there's other guys that just fall and fall it's it's a crapshoot and it's it's a fun one to watch. But are there any other, let's say, guard projected players in this draft, whether it's you know fifty four or eighty five or even later on that you think could be a value under the radar type of guy? Any position or, or just guard, just a guard at fifty four or just anywhere. I mean, is there, are there any guys that you really like? I guess in this draft. You know what I mean? Like I really like JV and Cohen. So there's there's a nice I think there's going to be a, a some some nice depth guys that I think with some starter upside that you're going to be able to get later on. Like um, I was watching a Florida State Miami game and just basically watching Florida State's defense and a guy that kept popping to me was their center Matt Lee, and he's a guy I think's going to be available in that fifth fourth fifth sixth round area that I think it's going to be multiple position versatility as a, as a reserve. Uh, Saitaoa Laulomea from mm. Utah played tackle at the Senior Bowl, played guard at the Senior Bowl. He's a guy I think can back up all four positions that I wouldn't mind taking in the fifth, sixth round. Um, Dominic Pooney, the same way from Kansas, another uh, five-position versatility uh, as a reserve to me. Played tackle at Kansas, played center at the Senior Bowl. So those are some guys I think Kingsley Egwakun from Florida. It's another guy as guard center versatility. And another, we talked about athletes, uh, Mason McCormick from South Dakota state um, is another guy who was like a 99.9 Raz. Oh, wow. So it's just, there's some, there's some freak athletes on this offensive line and they're going to be up and down all throughout the draft at, at all levels. Okay. That's awesome. Um, so I, it's just great to know that there's, options and there's potential for some of these guys to fall into the Browns laps and like we said at the top of the show remember guys the Browns this year are really drafting for depth and development we are not drafting for need there is no big glaring need and I know a lot of you will like Brian said before you guys are going to scream linebacker but remember linebacker is not a highly prioritized position for this Browns front office and the only draft capital we've really ever seen this front office use was JOK and he's not your prototypical middle linebacker he's he's a hybrid guy that 
provides a lot of versatility and flexibility on the defense. And I think that's what made him so enticing. And he was super young. So I think that's why the Browns moved up in the second round to get him a few years ago. But let's stick just a little bit real quick on the offensive line. And let's just talk about some tackles. Uh, I'm a big fan of Patrick Paul. I feel like he would probably be that second round range. Uh, How do you feel about Patrick Paul compared to a guy like we know the Browns met with and if I'm saying this wrong, correct me, Karen Amegedi. Good enough for me. Good enough for you. I okay, good. Perhaps it <laughs> so, I mean, those two guys right there, um, what can you tell me about Paul versus Amegedi? Amegedi is more of the upside guy, okay. I think, because you he played at Yale, right? So he's been blocking a bunch of lawyers and... <laughs> Uh, hedge fund <laughs> managers and everything else for the last four years, right? Fair. But he has great size, and he got injured early in the season, so he has had no workouts. Like no, he will have no testing data on him. Okay. I don't know if the Brown, if that's a big factor on whether the Browns draft a guy or not, uh, whether they want want those want that data or not. Uh, if, if that's the case, he may be off their board. But uh, he's he's going to go. Or right around where they pick at fifty four. I think I think the talent people are going to see the talent and the tape from his junior season to and the early part of this season that's going to allow him to go higher. Like I said, if he's not hurt, he's going to he plays at the Senior Bowl this year. Probably stands out there. Um, you mentioned Patrick Paul. I thought his Senior Bowl week was kind of up and down. I I I, I came in looking forward to seeing him, and I, I, he showed the flashes, but. Kind of had some 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 poor reps there as well. I I do, but because of like I said, we're going to see so many tackles go. I think he is in that second round in, area. And another upside guy, uh, the the rare uh, early three year only twenty twenty one year old from BYU, uh, Kingsley Suamatea. Browns um, met with him too. Yeah, he's a uh, like I said, he's another high upside guy, but he's got a lot. I mean, he's. He would be the perfect. I one of the. I won't say perfect player for the Browns. A guy you know doesn't have to play. Um, a guy that you can. He's probably inactive most oh, of the season. Really, like like you draft him high, like for the sheer fact, like you you mentioned Jedrick Wills and uh, Conklin. Con- Conklin could be out of here next year. You know, you you drafted Suamatea to uh, to uh, to be that guy in the future and. With his name, by the way, I, I, somebody had told me a trick about the uh, Polynesian names is okay. say every vowel. That that seems to be the trick. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I will keep um, that in mind for sure. But but another guy I like uh, at tackle in that second round area is Roger Rosengarten from uh, Washington. Everybody remembers the bad game against Michigan in the national championship game, but at the Senior Bowl and every other game, he was just as dominant as his much more ballyhooed teammate Troy Fawutanu. So, I just I, saw I, I like I just saw I a like mock Rosen. draft for the Browns yeah. with Rosengarten uh, going to the Browns, and that was a name I hadn't been familiar with. So I'm glad you brought him up because I wanted to mention him. Looks like he's got his six five three zero eight nine point one nine Raz. Yep, cool. Yep. I'm, I'm, and in the third round, you have guys, uh, some older prospects like Christian Jones from Texas and Javon Foster from Missouri are a couple of names to watch. Uh, Blake Fisher from Notre Dame is another one. But one I like for the Browns um, as a guy that was basically pointed out to me by another Browns writer while I was at the senior role was Delmar Glaze from yes. Maryland. Okay, And I went back and watched him, and I was like, man, this guy's got good tape. I was going to ask you good, about Glaze. Cool. He had a good week at the senior bowl, too. So he's a guy that late third round, I think he, I think he comes off the board in the first 100 picks. Okay. Yep. That was a name I had kind of bookmarked here that I would just want to throw at you and tell me what you thought. So cool. Delmar Glaze from Maryland is a prospect that I actually did a little bit deeper dive into just looking at guys the Browns had already had contact with a few weeks ago. And just going through his stuff, I'm like, this guy's popping off the page to me. Yep. I, I was I was really impressed with Glaze at the Senior Bowl. That was like, I, I hadn't really watched him before that. So that was one of those, okay, I got to go back now. And and he was super fun. So, All right, awesome. So before we move off of the offensive line, are there any other names you just want to mention, you just want to throw out there that you, you really like through your scouting or 
have we pretty much covered everybody? We, we've we've hit the high notes, um, especially. But uh, another like a uh, older prospect that would be a maybe a day three guy for the Browns, uh, Tylen Grable from uh, UCF is one on the interior. Um, maybe another redshirt type candidate is Zach Zinter from Michigan, who was potential second round pick. Uh, got injured during the season. And there's just some other versatile guys. I think uh, Bo Limmer from Arkansas, uh, CJ Hansen, Holy Cross. These are some guys that are all day three guys that the Browns could show some interest in. Gotcha. So those are some names to keep in mind if some of these higher projected tackles or guards that we were talking about don't yep. make it to the Browns or we elect to go with a different route. Those are some names that could fill that that draft spot if we go that direction. Before we, let's see, I want to talk running backs before we switch over to defense. There were two other wide receivers that I had thought of that I wanted to get your opinion on. Real quick, what is your take on, and a lot of Browns fans are throwing his name out all over our comment sections, we need to get Xavier Leggett. We need to get Leggett. I'll tell you my thoughts, but I think you can tell by my voice, not super high. How do you feel about Xavier Leggett? I love Xavier Leggett. You do? Okay, well, tell me why. I do. Because, I mean, well, he played in South Carolina. So oh. that's, that, that's the first start there. <laughs> so there's, there is there is a little built-in bias. Um, but he was a well-thought-of recruit coming out, but for some reason he just never got on the field. Now, if you read into the story a little bit, there's some extenuating circumstances. You had the COVID year kind of setting back. He had some injuries that set him back, and he had some off-the-field issues with family, not like sure, like a personal trouble with the law, but yeah. you know, for some personal issues that kind of put him put it back. But in okay. the Gator Bowl um, two years ago, I was at the game, and he just exploded against Notre Dame. Had like ninety something yards receiving and a couple of touchdowns, and then that kind of set the tone for this season, where he just came out of the gate hot against North Carolina. Had like. 170 yards receiving then had another like 100 plus yards receiving the next week to where he was like had the like the fourth or fifth best season in South Carolina history receiving the ball and we're talking about Alshon Jeffrey Sidney Rice I mean they've had Sterling Sharp I mean they've had guys at that school and he was one of the better you know more productive seasons there they've ever had he's fast he's got great I mean he's definitely when they say height weight speed I mean, that's him, right? He's 6'2", 221, runs a 4'3", 940. Compare that. I mean, he's 40-plus pounds heavier than Xavier Worthy was. Mm, yeah. So, and he ran 4'3", 9. I mean, to me, that's just as impressive as Worthy at 160 pounds running 4'2", So, yeah. and all his other testing was outstanding as well. So, if you could look past why it took him so long, to produce and see that he's a solid route runner, catches everything. He can do, he can create separation. He can do, go up and get a 50-50 ball. You can see the appeal of why you would want him on your team. Now, if you're a stickler for early breakout age and stuff like that, which are great. I mean, yeah, those are good he, has one of, he has one of the worst like grades for early breakout age of any wide receiver in this class. May be the worst. Those uh, there's something to be said about because those guys tend to not hit. Yeah. So, and that's where my I mean, hang up is, and it's just yeah. now I, I did not go digging into the extenuating circumstances, the why. Right. right? And I'm glad you laid that stuff out. I, I'm just looking at the sheer numbers, saying, well, the dude played all you know, pretty much every game, or at least it seemed like in these you know his first yeah. four seasons, and he never had over 200 yards in any season. I'm like, that's that's not good. Like that's kind of a red flag. And then all of a sudden it was like, what do you have this year? Like 1200, 1300. Another thing that I think is going to help we get uh, going forward is the new kickoff rules. Oh, is he because a good returner? he was a good, he, that was where he made his hay. Interesting. The first, his first three years on campus. He had a couple of, like I want to say against Texas A&M, he had a hundred plus yard kick return for a touchdown. And he had another several big kickoff returns uh, at South Carolina. So I think, He's going to get additional value there. And if he was to say be the Browns pick at 54, I don't think they would because of the age thing that we talked about earlier. Right. But that would be to me where he made his immediate impact on their roster as he was wide receiver five 
but as a kick returner. And maybe like you said you mentioned that Naheem Hines, but I mean, he's another guy you didn't pay a whole lot of money. No. So you see what happens. Yep. And the I guess the other thing with Leggett for the Browns anyway, there have been no indicators whatsoever that they're interested because they have right. I, I haven't seen anything where they met with him at any step along the way, there's not like a top 30 visit schedule. And it doesn't mean they didn't do that. I don't think they did that with Tillman last year. He just fell to them and they thought value. So they took him, even though he was well, that, a little older. They prospect. would have met him at the senior bowl because oh, that's true. Every, everybody meets everybody at the senior bowl that's true. multiple times. So they, they've had conversations with him. Um, but, but again, I'm not even sure he's on the board at 54. So and that's very possible. I, mean, I, I, I think it's a very good chance. He's one of the Panthers picks at the top of the second round yeah well they need help there too big time (laughs) uh the last wide receiver uh, just real quick thoughts on malik washington from virginia one of the highly product most highly productive guys uh in the country this year and to me it's it's impressive considering virginia was a dumpster fire uh (laughs) at the quarterback position so for him to produce as high as he did he produced at northwestern before yeah. transferring over to uh, with another dumpster fire quarterback situation, so to me that says a excuse me that says a lot about a receiver is when you can overcome that kind of piss poor quarterback play to put up those kind of numbers. Yeah. Uh, it, it says a lot. I I think he's possibly uh, going to go on the first uh, towards the end of day two. Uh, maybe he's on the board early day three, but I, I think his his ceiling is probably in that you know. 75 to 95 range and then maybe a little bit after that i don't know about you but whenever i was watching some take on tape on malik washington doing a little digging i was if the browns were to grab him like in the third round or something i was thinking okay this could be the perfect elijah moore replacement after this year because i feel like malik washington can do some of the stuff that they wanted elijah moore to do last year that he just wasn't all that great at like the behind the line of scrimmage stuff the out of the backfield plays and things like that where i think malik washington could offer some upside and man is the dude when he gets the ball he it looks like he's hard he's small he's five nine or whatever but he's 190 he's almost 200 pounds he's like he's very thick and girthy and he's super fast and he doesn't go down i feel like i've watched so many times guys would hit him and then they go to the ground and he just takes off yeah he's he's in that clump of wide receivers that I think are all going to go in that same area with uh, Jermaine. We've already talked about Jermaine Burton, but with Javon Baker from UCF, I think Jacob Cowing from Arizona, Brendan Rice from Southern Cal, I think all those guys are going to be kind of clumped together. And it's just going to become team preference at that point, you know, as to what separates those guys to what teams. Yeah, that's very true. And I know if you guys are watching, listening to this, yes, we have been talking a lot of offense. But that's because that's really where the Browns need to start loading up and preparing for the future and the depth because the defense is pretty solid right now. We know there's no room for a safety on the Browns roster right now. No room for a safety. Maybe a cornerback because Andrew Barry always takes a cornerback. You can never have too many at that position. We don't know the future yet of Greg Newsome. He'll be here for 24. But beyond that, not really sure. And, you know, the, the defensive line... I know we've been meeting with a lot of defensive tackles and that's a great position to load up on as well, but who's not making the roster if we take a defensive tackle? We've already got five guys that if the season started tomorrow, they're easy roster locks. So it'll be interesting to see what they do, but the next position we do need to talk about because the Browns do need some help is running back. I've already alluded to this and the Browns just recently had a meeting with uh, Florida State running back Trey Benson, who I don't know about you, Brian, but I know a lot of scouts, a lot of analysts have him as either their top number one running back in the class or at least in the top three. So if Trey Benson's on the board at 54, is that a spot where the Browns would have to take him to get him? Is he worth that high of a capital in your opinion? And just talk to me overall about Trey Benson. This episode is brought to you by Danger Coffee. 
Browns fans, we talk about how Danger Coffee is made free from mold toxins that are in 45% of the world's coffee, but that's not all that Danger Coffee has to offer. Mineral and nutrient deficiencies are a big deal. They make you feel sick, tired, stressed, and they can give you brain fog. These deficiencies negatively affect your immune system, your digestion, sleep, metabolism. Have you ever wondered why you get an initial burst from your coffee? But then you get that little crash not long after. Danger Coffee's patent pending process remineralizes your body with more than 50 trace minerals and electrolytes, leaving you more energized, engaged, powerful. These micronutrients enter the cells to boost performance. They bind to toxins to provide detoxification support. I know that sounds like a lot, but the bottom line, guys, is minerals matter. And most of us really don't get enough of them on a daily basis. Danger Coffee delivers micronutrients, plus it gives you access to the minerals you already have. Head to DangerCoffee.com. Use our code DOGS, D-A-W-G-S, for 10% off your order. And that code can be used over and over. So you get 10% off every order you make using code DOGS. It's time to start every day off with a cup of coffee that gets you going and actually keeps you going. DangerCoffee.com. Code dogs. <laughs> Philip has just lost the respect of the youth league football team he coaches. He was asked what New England should do in the draft, and his answer was objectively terrible. The Athletic just wrote a great article about this, but Philip doesn't have the Athletic or the respect of a boisterous group of 11 year olds who once looked up to him. Learn from Philip's error. Get the athletic and get the info you need to speak draft fluently. I, I, Trey Mintz is running back one for me. Okay. But again, this is uh, the running backs are so clumped together. There, If you told me that of the top six running backs, you could see a different one be the first one off the board, I would be su- not surprised. That's true. Marshawn Lloyd, Southern Cal, Jonathan Brooks from Texas. Uh, Braylon Allen, Wisconsin, Blake Corum, Michigan, Jalen Wright, Tennessee. Any one of those guys could be the top running back off the board. And again, it's just going to come down to team fit. Trey Benson, I think, has breakaway speed. Um, and I think he's a better receiver that he's given credit for. Uh, just wasn't asked to do it a whole lot for the state. Um, like I said, I, I, I really like what he was, what, 4-3 speed, 4-3-9 speed, something like that. I think at the combine it was one of the top running backs there. He's got good size at 6 you know, six foot two twenty, I think yeah. it was. So, yep. yeah, I'd, he's 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 a perfect fit as an NFL. He's a perfect NFL running back. Um, if if the Browns want him, it's going to have to be at fifty four, um, because I think the next spot where a running back comes off the board is fifty six to Dallas. Ooh, yeah, and they might be a team that would move up, up to get for him. a running back because yeah. they 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 may be the one team that is desperate for a running back in this class. I don't think we're going to see one going round one, and nor should we. No, I don't. I, um, I agree with you. See one ever go? I don't think we should ever see one going round one. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm starting to think that way about safeties as well. Uh, going forward, as, yeah. as far as that goes, um, especially in this class. So this is a good year for the Browns not to need a safety. By the way, yeah, <laughs> yes, it is. So, um, but yeah, I think Benson would be a, a good a good target for them at 54 if that is the place they want to go. Um, because I basically you've you redone Chubb's deal to where it's kind of like we've cut some time off that sentence, right? So if 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 we need to go, we can go. Um, you signed a couple of free agent backs like Hines and and Foreman, but those yep. are band aids on a bullet wound. You're not trying thing. And then Jerome Ford's been kicking around now for what two years? But two years, it, what's he done? He's a fifth round pick. He showed yeah, last year that he's not he's not a feature back, right? He's a so, good compliment, a good change of pace. Right. So the, the, it, running back could be that position that they deem, okay, we, we're going to get the best guy on the board, whoever that they deem to be the best guy at 54, and the rest plays out as it goes. Yeah, because with the running back, as soon as Nick Chubb went down last year, the running game was just, they were patchworking that thing together the entire season. Then we started to lose linemen. And you saw, wow, Nick Chubb could really, you know, make up for a lot of inefficiencies at times in the blocking and things like that because he can create space on his own where Jerome Ford could not. If the if the lane wasn't clearly visible and open and waiting for him to go, he couldn't go. Now, if he got into space, home run, dude's gone. He's got super super speed and he's he's great that way. But getting into space was so difficult. And if the Browns want to do a more spread out offense. 
and really utilize these receivers and Deshaun Watson to the best of their ability, I think you got to have a strong running game to lean on at times whenever you need to in the weather or just to keep the defense honest. And I, if they pulled the trigger on Trey Benson in the second round, though, you know, I would be a little surprised just based on value and things that positional mm-hmm. value. I would not hate it. I would be very excited to have Trey Benson in Cleveland. And it, it may be one of those where maybe they value a different running back. Uh, maybe they like Jonathan Brooks and they think his, and that's, I don't know if they brought him in for a visit, but that would be one that you want to get your medical team on because right. of him coming off the ACL. Um, Braylon Allen is a big back. Yes, he like, is. And he's going to end up in the AFC North. It just <laughs> depends on what team. I, I, I think I, he, he, he's an AFC North back, right? He's, he, he may end up in Pittsburgh, Baltimore, maybe even Cincinnati, maybe Cleveland. He's going to, I think that he's going to fit on one of those teams uh, for sure. Or maybe the Tennessee Titans, you know, maybe they're trying to replace, you know, replace Derek Henry with that. So, um, the, those are the two running the the other two running backs. I think that they would consider um, at at, at fifty four. Gotcha. So as far as meetings go, w- the list I have, the most recent that I've been able to find, the main running back they've met with, at least that would be in contention at fifty four, is Trey Benson. I did not see them any reports of them meeting with any of these other guys or ha- bringing them into Cleveland. So it seems like that might be the target, at least if they get to that point in the draft they're like that's the best value on our board that's still available let's take him but the other running back that we've actually gotten kind of hyped on on this show uh Kenny Mack our Canadian host he brought this guy up a couple weeks ago loves him and he'd be a later guy but what do you know about Aiden Robbins from BYU I feel like you said Braylon Allen's a big dude this guy's like 6'1 240 or 235 ish he's a big back as well right um yeah he's 6'2", 237, and he, uh, at the CGS, ran 4'6", um, in the 40. That's a UDFA to me. I mean, you brought him in. That's kind of what we talked about, too. For, for, for that. I, I, I don't think you're going to waste it. Or I, I'm not, not Waste is the wrong word. Yeah, I know I don't you think you're going to use a, 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 a draft pick on, on Aiden Robbins. I, I, I think that's – he kind of screams – undrafted uh free agent and he may be one of the first calls they they're they're on the phone with as the seventh rounds ending that they're, they're the scouts on the phone with and trying to get him in yeah that's true and i mean it's not udfa especially when you've got andrew barry making some of those decisions with his yeah. team and that front office because you know d'anthony bell two years ago ronnie hickman last year uh, he can find undrafted free agents that come in and it's like wow they actually made the team we had uh, muhammad diabadi a linebacker made the team yeah. last year so we We've been doing pretty well in the UDFA department as you know. Are there any other running backs that you think could be a good value for the Browns, or is it just kind of take Benson high if he's available, or you know, maybe just shoot shoot for a later round pick or a UDFA? Two two running backs I think that would be late round targets. I think the Browns could look at uh one is Kamani Vidal from Troy. Uh, one of the better, highly productive backs out of the Sun Belt this year. Played at the Senior Bowl, catches the ball well, runs, explodes through. He's a good pass blocker despite being a smaller back. Uh, measured in at five seven, almost a little under five eight, two thirteen. But ran four four six, eight point eight one Raz. I mean, he's he tested well. The other guy didn't test because at the Senior Bowl he tore his bicep in the first practice or towards the end of the first practice, but. After that first practice, he was having one of the running backs tend to not be able to stand out during senior bowl or all-star game practices in general. Rasheen Ali, mm. during that first day of senior bowl practice, probably the best running back practice I've ever seen. Really? Okay. At the senior bowl. Talk I mean, to me about that, him, for He was sure. that good. Like I said, he he's he's a three three tool player. He can block. He can run. He runs fast. got good speed. And uh, you, he can catch the ball well. Uh, he was one of the like in the one on one pass blocking drills. He stood out as, as just never really got beat. Um, where he's at in his bicep recovery, I don't know. Um, could he be ready for training camp? That's I'm not. Sh- I don't know how science or medicine works. So <laughs> it's uh, that's that's not. For me. I don't know the timetable on those injuries. Uh, like I said, if it was a knee injury, I would say no, but. 
with an arm injury, I guess it just depends on rehab and stuff like that. He could be ready for training camp. But he would be a guy I think the Browns could target uh, later on day three along with Padal from Troy. I'm glad you brought up Rasheen Ali because I did a couple mock drafts a week ago, post on Twitter, and I took him with the last pick for the Browns at that time. And I had immediately somebody who was a Marshall fan said, hey, let me just tell you, this guy would be a steal that late in the draft. And I thought, okay, cool. Because I was looking back through like just his college production and things like that. Touchdown machine. I, I forget what the total number was, but every year it was like 12 or 15 or 17, just racking up touchdowns, which we, we I don't know how you feel, but based on everything I listen to, touchdowns is like what they call a sticky stat, where if you are able, like if you're a touchdown guru, that's just kind of your thing, that translates typically pretty well to the NFL. Yeah, a hundred percent agree. And that's one of those things where like, if you see a guy didn't score a lot of touchdowns, why didn't you, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's the thing. And that's why I think, you know, what uh, Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU, the wide receiver, I think he's one of the reasons that I think he's going to have a good NFL career, despite being probably the fourth wide receiver off the board this year is the man had 18 touchdowns this year. He was also a touchdown machine. That is true. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, he had like five, four or five against Mississippi State, I think it was, in one game. So, guys like that, like you said, they tend to they tend to make it uh, in the NFL. So, yeah, I, I really like Rasheen Ali. Um, he should probably go higher. If not for the bicep tear, I think he's probably a fourth-round pick. Okay, cool. Uh, it's definitely a name to keep an eye on if the Browns do not take a running back earlier on you know day day two or whatever so let's just real quick last spot here on offense I know I didn't talk to you about this ahead of time but the Browns desperately need help at tight end because right now it's David and Joku and it's Jordan Akins and God forbid anything happened to David and Joku or he has to you know let's face it David you hurt yourself somehow every freaking year last year you burnt like dude come on Stay out of the fire. But, you know, something <laughs> happens all the time, but he's one of the toughest guys. But God forbid he gets hurt, has to miss a stretch of games or anything. What do the Browns do at tight end? Because we had a whole season now of Aikens. That didn't really pan out for much. And we we could really use some help there. So throw some tight end names at me that... Now, do I think the Browns would go tight end in the second round? Probably not. They did meet with Jatavian Sanders from Texas. I personally am a bigger fan of... Ben Sennett, is that how you say his name? Yes. I like Ben Sennett from Kansas State a lot better than Jatavian Sanders. But talk to me maybe about those two guys. Would those two guys be in play at 54 if that's the position they wanted? I I could, yes. Sanders uh, would definitely be in play there at 54. Uh, I wish he tested better. Yeah. Um, and he has moments on tape. Uh, Sennett is a, just, man, he tests it so well. And guys that test that well, tend to play well in the NFL. So Senate as he can block, he can catch. He's a solid route runner, had a good week at the senior bowl. Uh a guy I think would be fun for the Browns, maybe in the third round, maybe in the fourth, depending on where he falls on the board, is Shaheem Bell from Florida okay. State. He was at the senior bowl. We talked to Barry. He was Shuck at the about senior him. bowl, yep. started at South Carolina. He was South Carolina's leading rusher three years ago. Oh, really? Because <laughs> they ran into issues, and he was the best athlete, so they put him back there, and he ran the ball. Cool. Um, but he is track sp- – he's got very good speed. Um, he's small. He's smaller. That's why I said I'm using tight end in air quotes. And it's like I, – because I think he's more of a just offensive weapon, if you will. He can play running back. He can play fullback. He can play H-back, which I think is where he would fit in with the Browns in that H-back role. It's, he measured at six foot two, two forty one, but um, with four six one speed, one five eight. But he's a thirty five inch vertical. Like I said, he can he can fly by defenders. Like you'll see him go like just run by safeties, uh, running running down the seam. He's a guy I think. Like I said, with the right offensive coordinator, uh, is going to be a fun NFL player and it's going to have success. Um, kind of almost reminds me. What's the guy with Washington? Not. Everybody wants to say Reed, but not Jordan Reed. Um, Chris Conley, is that his name? It's going back a little ways. But he was more of an H-back for Washington, and he had a very good NFL career before injuries got him. I think he's more in that role where he's just going to be a fun 
fun player for an offensive coordinator. Gotcha. Okay, so Jaheim Bell, a name to keep an eye on for sure. And then the other tight end that I know the Browns have met with that I wanted to bring up, and I also just, I love the guy's last name. He does not spell it correctly, but it's Eric All from Iowa. Yes. Yeah, so he's one of the, uh, transferred from Michigan uh, to Iowa this year, then got hurt. Yep. So he, you, you're you going to get no testing on him, uh, but he automatically is a good athlete because he played tight end at Iowa. That's the way I look <laughs> at it. Like you automatically become a, a, a good athlete just by playing that position at Iowa. Yeah, I think he's going to be uh, one of the ones where you're going to wait and see type of deals if you draft him. And, and if you draft him in the fifth round, you know, uh, maybe he's active a little bit. Maybe he's not uh, as that third or fourth tight end, but could develop because you like the traits. Okay. Yeah. I, some, just some of the scouting stuff I'd, I'd listened to about Eric all was the dude could probably be tight end two in this class, depending on his health, I, just based on the traits and what, you know, people have seen on film. So I was just curious where you kind of had him ranked in the mix with some of these other guys, but. I know yeah. health again with the Browns, especially after last year, it's something they've definitely, and maybe that's why they, they also elected to bring him in for a visit so they could, cause they can get yeah. uh, medical yes. insight. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, so that could the, been the, the, this tight end class, unlike last year's man, where it was just. Yeah. Tight ends after, after this year, it's Brock Bowers. And, and then and shoot your shot. The right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hope for the best. Draft an athlete and see what happens. That's what kind of where I'm at. Okay, so for all the Ohio State Buckeye fans out there who watch the show, who love Cade Stover, and don't get me wrong, I Cade Stover was one of the most fun guys to watch at Ohio State these last couple of years because he's he's your big, just jacked up farm boy body that just doesn't give two flying f's about anything and just totally physical guy. Loved watching him play. That doesn't always mean it translates to the NFL or that he's going to be a good player in the NFL. But what do you think, Brian, about Cade Stover? I think he's a solid player. I okay. just, he doesn't do anything that, you know, is grandiose of any sure. of any nature. Uh he's a solid athlete. He's in the he's a green Raz. He's, so he's 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 he meets that threshold. He ran four six five, which is fine. Mm-hmm. Um He's got good at, hands. At, he's got good hands, yeah. right. And 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 the what I will say positively about Cade Stover is, even with Stroud last year and with uh, McCord this year, he's a guy they look to in the red zone. That's right? true. Like, yeah, he was a reliable option. Uh, that is the type of guy where they know if they throw the ball his way, you're going to be fine. So I, I I don't think you draft that on day two. I think okay, that's yeah. a a fourth round target would be Cade Stover, in my opinion, for the Browns. Okay, because I've, I've kind of seen some of the analysts and scouts and everything all over the place on Cade Stover. Like, some have him higher, some are like, nah, it's just not going to work. And I do feel like he's got a place in the NFL. I, I thought that at Ohio State, again, great hands. See, I don't know as far as, like, how to evaluate route running for the tight end, but it just seemed like he was always where he needed to be. He was always, he found a way to get in position to be open for the quarterback. And that's what, that goes to your reliable target kind of yeah. thing, especially yeah. in the to, red zone. To, to me, when I'm looking at a at route running for a tight end, if it's third and five, are you open six yards down the field? Yeah. To yep. me, to me, that's what I want from my tight end. I want you to be where you need to be open over the middle of the field to give my quarterback that easy, reliable target to move the chains, live to fight another day. Um, if you're, can't get loose of the linebacker. I I, yeah. I got nothing for you. I can't help you. you you're you're going to be looking for another line of work. That's very true. All right, so I think that kind of wraps things up as far as the offensive side of the ball. Defense, there's not a whole lot to talk about. I know we could talk about a couple of these defensive tackle prospects. I guess maybe we should just because the Browns have been meeting with with them. And let's just talk about. Uh, I think it was McKinley Jackson from Texas A and M. I think we should talk about Michael Hall from Ohio State, another Ohio State Buckeye. And I'm trying to think who the other defensive tackle was. Oh, uh, Tavondre Sweat. This episode is sponsored by Aura. Browns fans, your online data and identity are way too precious to be left 
just hanging out there in the open for these data stealing thugs to come after it, take it and sell it to whoever they want. Scammers and spammers are just capitalizing on all of your data being sold. And I'm telling you right now, you don't even realize it because I didn't realize it. Head over to Aura, A-U-R-A dot com slash dogs, D-A-W-G-S. Get a 14 day free trial. This is what I did. Create your account and then you can run your data check, a free data check, and it will tell you how many data brokers are selling your information on the dark web and in different areas of the internet. And then Aura starts working immediately to remove your information from those places. I kept thinking I was good online. I was fine. I wasn't doing anything crazy with my information. I was being cautious while I was shopping online, all those things. And still, when I ran my check, I had 14 data brokers identified selling my information and or immediately started taking my name and all my information, my address, my email, my phone number, everything out of those places. I am so sick and tired of getting the spam emails, getting the spam text messages, the calls, and it's time to put all that crap to an end. So check out Aura, 14-day free trial, run your checks, see what all the features they have to offer, like their VPN, their parental controls, everything that they have to protect your online identity. Aura.com slash dogs. Take back control of your identity today. So Vondre Sweat is interesting to me because he was that player I was referring to. Are the Browns looking off field now? Because yeah, this guy's got, got some issues. I mean, just got a DWI two days or two week or a week ago, yeah. two weeks ago, and this is after he told NFL teams, "Yeah, I've got alcohol issues." <laughs> I didn't I'm hear that to, part I'm of trying, it. Okay, yes, he's had. Uh, this is not new for him. Man, okay? we just did the Perion Winfrey experiment too. Right, and I like Perion Winfrey too, too, but I didn't know all that off field stuff. So, but it's like, and then see, and and that's the thing. I'm kind of glad we're getting this out now because a lot of times when you see a player drop. During the draft, you're like, well, I don't, why is he dropping? And then you find out about the stuff like with Perry and Winfrey, and then it, it, it doesn't go away. With Sweat, he is the best nose, pure nose tackle in this class. Okay. He's 365 pounds. He moves well. He's a good athlete for that size. He refused to weigh in at the senior bowl. Hmm. Only the second time I've ever seen that. Uh, Devontae Smith was the other one. Him, but that's it was understandable. complete opposite yeah. ends of the spectrum on why they would refuse to weigh in. <laughs> right. Uh, so, but he looked every bit of 365, 370 pounds in Mobile. Uh, he had the combine. I think he weighed 360 or somewhere along like that. But then, but man, two, three weeks before the draft, you get a DWI. That, wow. if nothing else, is just failing the stupid test. <laughs> so <laughs> That's a great way to put it. It's, it's. It just shows a lack of intelligence yeah. more than anything. And to find out that this is not his first issues with alcoholism. And and it's a thing, man. I mean, it's it's a it's a thing for a lot of people that a lot of people deal with, but you're you're a stud football player at the University of Texas. You tell him you can't get a ride share thing set up, something like that. Come yeah. on. I mean um, you're talking about the the investment that a team has to make just to even draft you. I mean, there, there's right. there's financial investment based on where you get drafted and then all the other stuff. And for you as a player, I mean, you, you're risking a huge opportunity. Not many players get the opportunity to play in the NFL. Not many players right. get the opportunity to get drafted or drafted high for that matter. So you're right. It, it really did fail the stupid test on this one. In my opinion, I think, I think he's still going to go on night two. I I think it's going to be probably in the last seven picks. Uh, I think Baltimore is a team that would take a chance on someone like that. Hmm. Well, if he goes Down to Baltimore, it means he's going to be really freaking good. Right, and and that's the sucky part about it for everybody else. Because and see, and that's another thing why I said I said Baltimore because every year we're all left in bewilderment. Like, how did this guy <laughs> fall to the Ravens? Yeah, it happens every year. It's going to happen this year. Is sweat that guy and ends up having a great NFL career? I hope so. I hope. I hope for his sake, he he figures it out. Um, but yeah, he's definitely a guy. Now you mentioned McKinley Jackson quickly. He's probably the number two nose tackle in okay. this class, but he's much further like down talent level uh, for me. But he was a five star player coming out of high school, not too far from here, uh, about forty five minutes up the road. 
um, and Wooddale, Mississippi, uh, and then goes to Texas A and M. Doesn't have a great career there, right? Doesn't ever really live up to that five star um, reputation. And then he comes to the Senior Bowl, and he was kind of <laughs> okay uh, at times. He would flash, but a lot of times he got worked by some of those interior offensive linemen. And it's a good interior offensive lineman class, so I can understand it. But I th- I think he's a guy that fourth round, mid fourth okay. round. I would I could see McKinley Jackson coming on floor. Who was the other one? Uh, Michael Hall from Ohio. Michael State. Hall. Now Michael Hall, I think is going to go higher than consensus has him projected right now, just because of how athletic he is and he can get to the quarterback. So that I think is going to be more valuable to a team early on, uh, and especially in a rotation type situation like you would be when Cle- in Cleveland. Um, that could sure. be a guy I could see them targeting. Just because he can give you some pass rush upside on third down, like you've got, I mean, you've got him inside with, you know, Smith and uh, Miles Garrett. Yeah, you know, you're you you could be okay there with a, with a guy like Mike Hall, and I think to me he could be one of those targets at fifty four. That's interesting because the Browns have met with him, and what I was kind of reading about him. 6'2", 299s, 300 pounds. Not exactly long enough, rangy enough to be on the edge consistently and not heavy enough and bulky enough to consistently play inside. But a 9'5'7", Raz, like you said, super athletic, quick for his size, can get after the quarterback. So we, we've we seen smaller guys like that have success at the NFL level. And he's like a local high school kid up there too, right? I want to say he was in the Akron area somewhere like that maybe. I'm not sure. I thought it was maybe Streetsboro. Yes. I think I saw. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Yep. So. so does uh, it actually feels, count as a top 30 pick, right? Because it's right, within 50 right, miles. Because he would be a local. He would come in with their local visits. Yep. Very cool. Uh, as far as, I mean, defensive tackle, I don't want to go too much further down that position just because, again, the Browns, Tomlinson, uh, Hurst, we just signed Shelby Harris. We've got Ika. We've got Quentin Jefferson. There's your five guys that are on the roster if the season starts tomorrow. So drafting a guy is going to push. We only kept four last year going in the season. It's going to push somebody off the roster. We're not keeping six defensive tackles. Right. So everybody who wants the Browns to take a defensive tackle, just think about that. We would have to probably sacrifice somebody. Well, the thing is, right, I mean, they're kind of tied to the cap. So maybe that ends up being – um, a place where you can move one of these guys for a 25 draft pick if if you were to draft someone like Mike Hall. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, that's true too. And 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 it, you, you're you playing from a position of strength and that, that's what I think the Browns would like to do, right? You know, yeah. just keep stacking these guys and then just pick up extra draft capital for next year. Definitely. And I think really <clears throat> the last position we need to talk about, we started the show talking about it, and we will end here, but let's talk about linebackers. Let's, and, and I don't necessarily have a whole lot of specific names. I, I guess I, I take that back. I kind of do. I've got like J.D. Bertrand. I've got Cedric Gray from North Carolina. And, you know, a guy like Jeremiah Trotter Jr. gets floated around a lot out there among circles. And, you know, if the Browns are looking, Trevin Wallace from Kentucky. Okay, I guess I lied to you. I do have some names, but, you know, I don't think the Browns go any sort of linebacker route at 54. I think there's too many needs. Wide receiver, running back, offensive line on offense. I think that's probably where they go. But later in the draft, maybe even that third round or fourth, fifth, whatever, who are some of these linebacker prospects that you think could really be good in the NFL? Um, Well, you mentioned Jeremiah Trotter off the top, and I think we're just going to cross him off the list. Okay. Uh, because he's essentially JOK. That's and that's I mean, kind of what I thought by reading. So go, yeah, okay. so so it becomes monotonous uh, there. I think you. I like that you mentioned Trevor Wallace because I think he's a guy that's going to go higher than what he's currently projected, and he's young, which definitely fits in what the Browns want. He's got good size at two thirty seven, six foot one. Uh, ran a four, he's nine point three one uh, Raz four five one speed. 37. I mean, he's explosive. Um, he can cover uh, a tight end. He can cover a running back in a pinch. So he offered, and he has some pass rush upside. Uh, he had he had a few sacks this year for Kentucky on, on the blitzes and stunts and stuff of that nature. So 
I think Trevin Wallace is, like I said, I think he's going to go higher than what he is right now. Um, I love Cedric Gray. I think if you're not drafting him at 54, you're probably not going to get him. I think okay. he's going to be one of the first linebackers uh, off the board. Uh, he's currently my linebacker, too, just because I love the way he covers in space. I, I think he's maybe one of the better coverage linebackers uh, in this class. Uh, further down, uh, Ohio State kid Tommy Eichenberg, I think, is a fourth, fifth-round guy. Good production. I think he would fit that that the Browns look for. Because to me, I think if they're drafting a linebacker, they're going to look for a guy that's immediate special teams, like core special team guy from, from day one. Which brings me to guys like Tyron Hopper from Missouri is another name I think is going to go in that mid-round area. Uh, Adafuan Uofosio from Washington, mm-hmm. an older prospect, but he also covers really well. And uh, a guy who's just a freaking headhunter um, is Nathaniel Watson from Mississippi State. Dude had double-digit tackles at the Senior Bowl in a all-star game. The really? Man close to double-digit tackles <laughs> okay. in the game itself. So... And he was, I mean, he was out here like laying the lumber in an all-star game. That's I'm like, awesome. Respect this guy. <laughs> uh, good, 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 good on you. But he's another one with good size, and and uh, he didn't test as well as I would have liked. Uh, but six two two thirty three. He's got good length for thirty, almost thirty three inch arms. Ran four six three in the forty, but wasn't near as explosive, or his shuttles weren't that great. But uh, I think as a fifth sixth round pick give me that guy on my special teams all day long that's awesome because those are the types of linebacker prospects i'm looking for later in the draft because yep. that's you know they uh, tony fields sioni taki taki mm-hmm. take some of these guys jacob, uh, jacob phillips take them a little bit later and i think jacob phillips actually had potential to be a decent linebacker but he just couldn't stay healthy and i have no idea whatsoever what to expect from devin bush this year and i think there's there's high upside there, and there's also the possibility where he barely plays at all, and I think Andrew Barry understands that, and I thought that that signing was a good one because for what they paid him, the risk is well worth it, and if it doesn't pan yeah. out, you know, really no harm, no foul. Just I would like to see them get a guy moving forward that we can rely on because, again, Hicks, we talked about him, tackling machine. I think he's going to be great in that Anthony Walker role, but he's older. He's like 30, 31 yeah. years old. So we definitely need to be looking to, okay, who's going to hold down that spot mm-hmm. for the next three or four years? What I think a lot of Browns fans also may not be used to than, than their style of drafting is a lot of these guys that they're going to take in that fifth, sixth, seventh round, these are guys that they're drafting so they don't have to compete with everybody for UDFAs. So these are guys that from a lot of what I'm hearing is you're going to see a lot of that on in the middle to late portions of day three because the depth overall depth of this class isn't great. A lot of guys that are going to get drafted would be UDFAs in almost any other year. Mm. So, kind of like take that out, take that into your mind just a little bit. Like, why did we waste a draft pick on this guy? Well, this guy was a guy they want to bring in as a UDFA, but they don't want to be burning the phone line up immediately after the draft and have to throw a mega bonus at them or whatever. They just draft them, low risk, low reward, bring them in. We don't have to compete with three other teams to sign them as a UDFA. So kind of get that mindset mentality going as well when you start getting into that sixth, seventh round. That's really smart. I'm glad you said all that because it it really makes that move that Andrew Barry just did trading Leroy Watt. Leroy Watt mm-hmm. is not going to play. Yep. Ever for the Browns. So get a seventh round pick. And like you said, yep. now we can take a flyer on a guy mm-hmm. and you never know. And it could be, a, I mean, we mentioned Aiden Robbins as, Hey, he's probably going to yep. be U, UDFA, but if all of a sudden there's like this run on running backs and it's like, yep. Ooh, there might not be that many to pick from use a seventh round pick on him just to make sure you get him. And I wouldn't be surprised to see Barry rack up another seventh round pick in some form here in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. Like, you know, like you, we, we've talked about trading down a lot. Yep. here right so you know or maybe somebody cra- something crazy like one of these defensive tackles that we have maybe we haven't even talked about or or wide receivers fall to them well now all of a sudden maybe a team later on on day three doesn't get the receiver they want so all of a sudden they call the browns about david bell 
and they kick a seven over to them or whatever, something like that. I'm just, I'm just yeah. throwing that name out there. Sure. But I mean, th- those are scenarios to kind of watch out for where you like, we mentioned like some of these defensive tackles or maybe a team didn't get the defensive tackle they want. Well, am I going to burn this seventh round pick or can I just send it to the Browns and get Maurice Hurt? I'm just saying his name. I don't know if you would trade Maurice Hurst or not, but I'm just, just throwing that out there. I would not. I love Maurice oh, Hurst. Right. But, I mean, why know. wouldn't you? But, yeah. you know. No, and David Bell's a great name for that. David Bell, I've talked about this before. He's taken the Demetri Felton route so far in his career where his snap count from, like the same thing with Felton, decent decent snap count in his rookie season, and it cut significantly to his second season. Third season for Demetri Felton, half the season he was healthy and active and then gone. They cut him. And that's the path, unfortunately, that I'm, I, that's the trend I'm seeing for David Bell. But I'm glad you talked... One last name. One last name I want to talk about because this is a guy that I don't even know how I 100% feel about him, and it's a wide receiver, and he would be that 54 pick. But talk to me about Keon Coleman. Oh, man. Keon Coleman is, he's an enigma, right? Because you see the flash, you see the bang. There's a fireworks play almost in every game with this guy, right? And then he's dropped three other passes that you kind of forgot about. Ah. It's hard for him to separate. I, I don't see him creating a whole lot of separation at the NFL level. He's not fast, but he's big, right? But he gives you special teams upside because he's a great punt returner mm. in Michigan State. He's a great punt returner at Florida State. But you don't see that he can separate on a return, but can't separate from a corner. <laughs> but he's great at getting the 50-50 ball. Right. So it's, I, I, I go back and forth because it's like I see a lot of like with Bengals mocks that mocking Keon Coleman for the Bengals at pick 49. That's like, no, (laughs) I I don't like that at all. Do I want him? I don't know. (laughs) But do I, I mean, would I be okay? Maybe (laughs) the upside is there. He's only, he's a three year player. He's six, three, two, 13. So he's like, he's a four, six, he's a four, six wide receiver. Yeah. That, that, that hurts, but he's 38 inch vertical in a, almost 11 foot broad jump. So you're like, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's anybody who's very productive too. You mentioned touchdowns. He caught a lot of those. Yeah. So I, mean, I, don't, I, know. I don't know, man. Keon Coleman, an enigma. Well, I'm glad that you're as like, I have no idea where to put this guy as I am because there's times when I think, yeah, I think he would, he would fit well with the other wide receivers. And then I'm like, we already have Cedric Tillman. So I, right. yeah, they're very similar too. Very yes, similar. Very. And I like Cedric Tillman last year. So I did too. I like that pick for the Browns. You know, I and I Blake gave me some flack in a show right after the season because I said I was disappointed in Tillman. I expected I just expected more in his rookie season. Just third round pick. I was very high on him coming out of college. I thought he had great potential. And I just thought, ah, man, that rookie season was very underwhelming. And then over time, as I think about things a little more, you know, he was fourth or fifth on the depth chart we had dpj there for the first half of the season and then when tillman did kind of get more playing time he was playing with dtr and pj walker and you know it's like eh. i i can understand why his rookie season left a lot to be desired and i definitely still have pretty high hopes for cedric tillman but all right brian we have done a lot of players in this episode and can I ask you one more? Go for it. <laughs> what about Lad McConkey? Because I know the Browns just met with him. We haven't talked about that on the show yet. He You're will not be head. available. He not will not available. be available for okay. them at 54. That's kind of what I figured. He may go at the back end of the first round. Okay. I've seen that. If Buffalo drafts him at 28, not not, not shocking to me. I, okay. I think Kansas City will be a, a team that targets him as well. I could see San Francisco now with all the Brandon Ayuk. Uh, yeah issues they may be having um could be a target there for them as well i mean he's you you want to stereotype him but you can't right <laughs> yeah so i mean he's just short of six foot uh but runs a four three nine and some of the best shuttles in this draft three nine seven short shuttle four what was it, four something uh three, six something three cone I mean, it's just 
he's such a great route runner. He catches everything, and he was so productive. I mean, on the best team, one of the best teams in college football, he was easily their go-to and best wide receiver. Lab McCaukey has everything that you need to succeed in the NFL as a wide receiver, and I think wherever he goes, be it, I guess I mentioned Buffalo, I think Carolina, uh, if he falls out of the first round, I think he's probably the first pick of the second round. Gotcha. All right, so whenever we do our live draft show on Friday night, covering the second and third round day two, we will be talking about Ladd McConkey at some point, but it'll probably be in recap of night one or real quick on night two, and as, right. as you're saying. So I'm not surprised to hear you say that. I think that, I think you're absolutely right. But Are you guys doing a live stream or anything for the draft? Yes, okay, it's going to be a little bit different that. this year, but okay. we, will, uh, we will be live streaming all three days. Okay. Uh, we're going to go bell to bell night one. We're going bell to bell night two and bell to bell day three. Nice. We're gonna work. Good for you guys. We don't know exactly the format yet because, like I said, there's some changes happening, but um, it's it, we're, we're definitely going to live stream all three days. All right. Well, if you guys want to get more of Brian Bosarge, right there is a great way to do it. Make sure you guys, where, where are you going? Is it on YouTube? You, get to, uh, you can go to youtube.com slash the draft countdown the draft countdown go check that out countdown. subscribe to their channel because who wants to listen to the, the talking heads on ESPN do all their crap listen to Brian because if you if you didn't like this episode I don't know what you got what's wrong with you guys because this was a ton of fun and you can get three straight days of that but you know if you're going to watch Brian on day two just make sure you you know multi-screen it with ours but you know that's all good <laughs> Open up two tabs, you'll be fine. Hey, two tabs, that's right, yeah. Everybody's got two monitors these days, right? Just <laughs> throw one on each screen. Absolutely, or just watch one on your phone, no big deal. But, man, I'm really, really thankful that you came on again this year and talking draft. This is always so much fun. We say, well, we got to do more stuff during the during the year. And then life goes on, and it's like, oh, crap, the draft's coming up. Better <laughs> get with Brian. <laughs> hey, it's always say, I love this. I love you guys' show. Uh, I watch it if, if nothing to see what's going on behind enemy lines, right? That's right. That's right. So we will have a good AFC North competition this year. I just, I for once, I want Deshaun Watson, Joe Burrow. I want everybody to stay healthy. I want to see a good competitive season from all these teams. And as much as you know, we give other fan bases crap and stuff. It's no fun yep. watching a, a struggle fest between Kenny Pickett and DTR. That's just no. Nobody, nobody likes nobody that. wants that nobody wants and, and, that and, and and like i said we've we've talked about all these players that could impact the browns this year none of it matters if watson doesn't stay healthy exactly and it's the same way for every team we talk about all the time what the yep. browns did last year that is an anomaly right there like that's an yep. outlier because you don't go to the playoffs and win 11 games starting five different quarterbacks during the season it just doesn't happen so can't count on, miracle yeah flacco, <laughs> yeah can't count on that every year but Make sure you guys check out draftcountdown.com. Follow Brian. Follow Brian on Twitter at Deep Fry Draft. And then follow Draft Countdown at Draft Countdown. So check those, check them out. Give them some follows. Give them some love. Subscribe to the channel. And make sure you guys like this video. Subscribe to our channel. Continue to help us make that push to 10,000 subs. We are getting closer and closer every day. We appreciate everybody tuning in. Brian, is there anything before we wrap it up that you want to say to everybody? Now, we'll have uh, three different mock drafts. Uh, that will all drop within the the later of the draft. That'll be the next mock draft you see at draftcountdown.com. But we got daily, uh, pretty much daily content going up every day between now and the draft. So everybody go draftcountdown.com, check that out. Do you have a first round mock already on the site for this for this year? Do I? Or does draft countdown? Yeah, we had a seven round mock drop on Monday. Okay. So. <laughs> well, I'm going, so I, yep, I'm checking that out immediately. So. <laughs> Go check out their mock drafts and just, you know, comment it up. Let everybody know what you think. We appreciate everybody tuning in. And until we talk to you guys next time on the show, let's go Browns, not Bengals. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Dogs Podcast. Make sure you subscribe on YouTube and follow us on Twitter at the Dogs Podcast. Get your thoughts on the show at thedogspodcast.com. Philip has just lost the respect of the youth league football team he coaches. 
He was asked what New England should do in the draft, and his answer was objectively terrible. The Athletic just wrote a great article about this, but Philip doesn't have the Athletic or the respect of a boisterous group of 11-year-olds who once looked up to him. Learn from Philip's error, get the Athletic, and get the info you need to speak draft fluently. Swimsuit? Check. Sunscreen? Check. Phone charger? Check. Don't forget to pack the 5-Hour Energy. It fits great in a pocket or carry-on, and the alert feeling will help you arrive ready for anything. Now get 20% off when you use code 5HETRAVEL at 5HourEnergy.com. Expires April 30th. One-time use only. Not valid with other discounts. Remember, visit 5HourEnergy.com and use code 5HETRAVEL to save 20%. 